slides for me, please. Um, really want to dodge this subject. It's been a very difficult week for me, but um, um, I'm just going to be I'm just going to be It's just me. So I'm going to read something with you, and, and we're just, just going to talk about it. Let's just do this, okay? I'm going to answer two questions tonight. This is, this is a silly question, but as, as I tell you what they're going to be, why don't you go ahead and open up your book, your uh, Bible to uh, Matthew 15. Over at verse 21, so we're going to start reading. If you need a Bible, just go to grab one of these off the, off the chairs. And uh, the main texts that we'll be using will be up on the screen. Not every one of them, just the long ones, so you can read it along in one of those Bibles that are here. If you don't have a Bible, just grab one. The yellow and the orange are all the same. Um, I'm going to try to answer a couple of questions. We've been studying the life of uh, Jesus as far as his miracles go. I want to just kind of check out his miracles and See how strong he is, and choose him as Lord and Savior. And if you're if you're a Christian and you're kind of down and you just need a little bump, you need to get back and refocus on the one who can do these amazing things. Get that encouragement. So that's what we've been doing for a couple months now. We're going to do the same here tonight. This will be a little bit different tonight in that it's not going to it's definitely going to talk about how strong he is and, and powerful and all that kind of stuff. But tonight's message is, uh, I think, more. Uh, I think it'll help you look at you more than the other ones. You know, like when he's walking on water and stuff. And when he's multiplying the food, I know we can glean things from it for ourselves, but really it still was about him. This one, I think, is more about for us, okay? So we're going to answer two questions as we read this. And the first one's going to sound kind of silly, but it'll just humor me, okay? The first question is this, is Jesus mean and stupid? Okay, I know I just said it in church, don't be later. Uh, Jesus mean and stupid, we read the text, we'll know what I'm talking about. And the second one is, what's the purpose of this healing miracle, and why was it recorded? The reason why I say why is it recorded is because not every miracle that he did was recorded. It says in the book of John that they didn't write down all the things, all the miraculous things that Jesus did, only some, and it was so that you believe. Okay, so what they chose, God chose this miracle in particular to record, and it was for a reason, okay? All right, so let's read this here, just about eight verses in Matthew chapter 15, starting verse 21. You all there? All right. Um, then Jesus left Galilee. Okay, he just got done... Um, Multiplying the food, he walked on water, so he's pull up, pulled off two pretty big um, miracles there. Then he's doing a little teaching, he gets done with that, he's in the area of Galilee, the little sea of Galilee where all those little towns are, he performs all those miracles. And then he leaves, then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre, Sidon. Uh, a Gentile woman who lived there came to him, pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. For my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. This story tonight is for those raising kids. Amen? Amen. You can connect, right? Okay, so, but Jesus gave her no reply. Not even a word. That is poker face. And his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Verse 28, dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great, your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. Okay, so the first question we want to ask is, is Jesus mean and stupid? Let me tell you what I'm talking about, okay? When I read this story, I, I've read the Bible a lot. And I see this great Jesus, and he's really good to everybody, right? And then all of a sudden, he's like, what's up? Right? He's kind of mean to this lady. Would you, I mean, if you didn't spend a lot of time in the Bible, and you just read this isolated story, would you say he's kind of mean? Like, that's not nice. Because we paint that picture of Jesus as the nice picture. The pretty picture of Jesus who's super kind and sweet to everybody, right? Well, this story just doesn't paint that picture, so I start reading this, and I'm, I'm pondering, and I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, what's going on here? And, and so and, and, and in my mind, in my mind, I'm, I'm insane. And so I think of these things. Think about this, though. You, you, before you think that Jesus is kind of mean or, or maybe stupid because he's asking silly questions, like taking food away from the kids and giving it to the dogs, I and mean, that's kind of mean and a silly question. But think about this for a moment. Do you ever look at somebody and just say, do you want me to knock you out? All the time, right? <clears throat> Do you want me to knock? Like we ask that question as if the person's going to say, "You know, Joey, I actually been thinking about it, and I would really like for you to punch me in the face." 
You know what I'm saying? We um, we ask the question because well, we are we asking that silly question because we honestly think that they're going to answer you by going, yes, I would like for you to give me a forearm shiver in the face. That's what I would like. Or are we asking that question, not because we expect a response, but because we're just kind of tell them something that maybe you're getting a little bit too close. You're getting a little too close here and you're starting to bother me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, how about this one? That's the funniest thing I've ever seen. How many times have you said that? What was, how many times have you said it's the funniest thing I've ever seen? Is it really the funniest thing you've ever seen? Or is it just trying to make the point that what you're watching, what you're seeing, is fun, right? That's the point of it, right? How about this one right here? Is that okay with you, dude? How do we give you this one? Is that okay with you, dude? If, like, if someone's getting a little bit overbearing, a little too pushy, right? And they're kind of telling you what to do, bossing you. You're not the boss, and you kind of, is it okay with you if I do that? Are you actually asking them for permission, or are you just trying to tell them, get out of my grip? I mean, that's what you're saying when you ask that silly question, right? How about this one? And if you're a parent, you've said this a million times. How many times do I need to tell you? <laughs> and Adriana sits down and says, you know, Dad, I was talking to Bailey, and I know you've told us like 12 times, <clears throat> well, we were kind of talking about it. And if you just tell us 36 times, then I'll answer. And I'll do it. I mean, do you actually ask your kid, how many times are I going to tell you because you actually expect an answer from them? Or are you just telling them that because you're telling them, I've told you too many times, get your act in here. That's why we're saying it, right? Well, God does the same thing. In Genesis, he makes, he creates all of heaven and earth, and there's the garden, there's Adam and Eve, and the animals, and the plants, and the trees, and the mountains, and the lakes, and all that stuff, and then sin enters the world, right? They eat the fruit, and all of a sudden, they feel shame, and they know what's wrong, and so what does God say? Adam, where you at? Paraphrase. Where you at? Was it because he didn't know where Adam was? I think he just created the whole world. He kind of knows where Adam is. Why is he asking Adam, where are you at? He's saying, where are you at? See, if you read the story, he's about to unpack what is wrong in Adam, right then and there. So he's asking him, where are you at? Not where are you at. It seems like a stupid question, but it's really not. How about John chapter 4, the woman at the well? It's a famous story, right? And so Jesus and this woman, this, this Samaritan woman, they're talking at the well, and he's, he's saying, listen, I'm the, 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 the water, the, it's a living water, and if you come and drink deeply, you'll never be thirsty. He's giving her this lesson. All of a sudden, she, he says, now go get your husband. And she's like, uh, uh, yeah, you don't have a husband. You got five. You're shacking up. Did, did, did he really think she had a singular, um, like, love romance with one person? Or was he, like, thrown off? No, because then he immediately answers her and says, oh, you don't have a husband. You got five. You just shack it up. How about Matthew 16, 6? He says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Heck is that? Are these guys, these, these religious guys, dressed like popes, walking around and going to bakeries and inserting themselves in loaves of bread? The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's Matthew 16, 6, but in verse 11, Jesus says, Why can't you understand? I'm not even talking about bread. He was talking about something different. He wasn't saying beware of the yeast, like yeast as you know it, to put in bread. He said, beware of the religious, legalistic attitude and, and practice of these people that will lead you astray. 1 John 3.20 simply says this. The answer to the question is, God's stupid. He says, God knows everything. He says, God is greater than our feelings. That room's free. In case you're feeling something. He's greater than your feelings, and he knows everything. So, really, he's not a stupid question asker. 
He is not an asker of stupid questions. What he's trying to do is he's trying to point out something in their heart when he asks these questions. And in this context here, if we go back to the text, what is, who, who's his audience here? His audience is not even this one woman. He's hanging out with his disciples, all these Jewish guys, these everyday Joes, that came to follow him. And they're following him, and they run into this woman together as a team, as a group. And they run into this woman, she comes up and she starts talking to him. And so when, when, <coughs> when he meets with this woman, he's got all of his Jewish disciples around him. So all these guys are Jews, right? And, and, and the Jewish people, they're a nation that God chose. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. He chose to show himself through this nation, through this group of people. And he did it, starting in Genesis 12, with God choosing Abraham. This is the start of the Jewish nation, from which this audience is. They're Jews. So he chooses Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and in verse 3, part of this process of choosing these people, he leaves Abraham with this really weird but powerful promise. And it is this, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now a careful look at Matthew chapter 1, if you wanted to go there, you can see in Matthew chapter 1, it gives the, the, the lineage of Jesus. And, and so in Matthew chapter 1, verse 2, it's, it talks about Abraham. And if you go to generation, 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 I believe it's over in verse 16, it says Jesus. So here it comes. Listen to the promise, okay? Listen to the promise. The promise is all families will be blessed through you, Abraham. Here comes Abraham, all the way to Jesus, and in Acts 1, 8, you will be my disciples, you will be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to across the earth, to the ends of the earth. Right? These are just great commissioned people doing their job, releasing the good news of Jesus to all families. What's the commission? Go to all people, right? So the promise that God gave Abraham just years and years and years before, I'm glad I can't You see that this promise to, to bless all the families on earth, all the nations of the earth, through Abraham is now, as you sit here today at Revolution Church, it is happening through Abraham, through to Jesus, to the disciples, to the ends of the earth, right here. And that's exactly what's happened. Okay, that's exactly what's happened. Now, go back to the text here. Why are we talking about... Uh, Stupid or, 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 or mean, right? Just look at his two responses here. I was sent only, verse 24, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. And he also says, it isn't right to take food from the children, you know, kind of these folks here, and give it to the dogs, like the, 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 the nothings. The, they're not worth anything. They're not even human. See, that, I'm Jewish. I have this ability that you might not have to grow up in that Jewish culture where that's what we thought we were. We were here, and you guys were here. We were chosen people, and you weren't. But really, if you think about it, all the nations of, of the earth will be blessed through you. So really, what's happened is that God is saying, I've chosen every single person, not just you. You've got short-sighted thinking right here. It's not just you. It's all people. That's what he's telling us. Okay, so just like these other weird statements that God said earlier, Adam, where are you at? The yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All these weird statements. Well, this one here is just the same. It too points out a flaw in the audience. That's what it was. He's not a stupid question asker. He's pointing out a flaw in his audience. He's calling out the Jewish people right here. See, their problem and, and it's our problem sometimes, too, is that they thought they owned God. There was a proprietary feeling in the air. They thought that he was their God. See, he's known as the God of the Hebrews, right? See, through a series of events, starting with Abraham and all the way through to Moses and the burning bush and the Red Sea and all that stuff, they had become his people. They worshipped him. Not, not always real good, right? 
They, sometimes they would worship him and sometimes they wouldn't. And sometimes they'd worship him and then they'd build a golden calf and they would worship it. So they weren't real good at it, but he was their God. But see, the God of the Hebrews doesn't mean the Hebrews own him. Okay? They thought that they owned him. But this awkward statement here, these two statements that he makes, they answer some questions, and it's this, that he's not a bloodline God. Are you Christian? Well, I, you know, I grew up Catholic. I didn't go to get it. I, are you Christian? Well, I'm not Jewish. But I ain't going to get it. Okay, you're going to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing that it does is it really, really invades this. And, and it's, man, I, it's becoming increasingly apparent to me, and I don't know about you guys, but it really, really invades this area of our lives, and that is man's tendency to look inward to himself. It's been like that since day one, but it seems to me, just one man's perspective from where I sit, that it's getting worse and worse and worse. Now, I'm not one of those guys, and, you know, like your parents, well, back in the day when I went to school, we went 50 miles each way with no air, no shoes, no clothes, and we went through the snow. I'm not talking about that it's getting worse, that our, my era was better than now, okay, but I'm just saying in this one area, I just think it's getting worse all the time. Man's tendency to look inward, and you can see it's very evident in this story when they, they just say, hey, I'll send her away. Send her away, she's bothering us. See, what, what, what they don't understand, and what we don't understand as people, is that there was a day where you were the one begging for his mercy, and he gave it to you, and so quickly we forget that his grace was upon us, and he chose to love you. You didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, he gave it. And this lady right here was doing the same thing, and they were like, you know what, I'm saved to hell with her. You, you hear that a lot. Now you might not, let's be honest, you might not say it. I might not say it, but sometimes my actions probably show it. And I'm speaking to all of us, we're all the same, we're all in the same boat. Sometimes our actions show it. And they're like, just, just send her away, send her away, but here's the thing. Look at the text. She worshipped him. And she was a Gentile. She was not Jewish, but she worshipped him. It says in some, uh, some verses about it says that she bowed low before him and she acknowledged him as the Lord of her life. It had nothing to do with her bloodline. It had nothing to do with her parents. She, on her own, went to him and worshipped him and acknowledged him as the Lord of her life. And, and this sinful... This default of the sinful man, I think, is getting worse. Let me tell you what this, this, this sin is. This is where it's going to get heavy, and I can just ask your grace. Would you just show of hands, okay? Let's, I know everyone in this room. So there, there, there's, I want this church to be filled with people. You guys with me, right? Oh, we all do. But tonight, I know everyone in here. So this is an extremely safe and loving environment to confront our sin. Would you agree? Is there anything wrong with that? Can, can I give, will you give, I have men in this church that speak openly to me about what they see in me that is wrong. I'm asking you for that same grace. Can I pick on you? Can I pick on you, just one man's observation? Will you promise me you won't get up when I say something that you know you do and I'm talking to you, I'm gonna try not to look you in the face, but would you just listen would you just hear me out? Would you please do that? Show of hands. Okay, we know everyone in here, we know each other. Who thinks people are selfish? Okay, now hold up, hold up, keep them up, okay? Okay. Everyone is raising their hand. The other people, you're included in their group. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Does that make any sense? Okay. You think people are selfish, right? People are selfish. She's saying the same thing. That means she thinks you're selfish. And she thinks you're, and you think she's selfish. Everyone thinks people are selfish. You can put your hand down. But here's the thing. Very rarely will we just look at, oh, these people make me sick. They piss me off. They're so this and so that. But they, we very, very, very rarely look at ourselves. Let's be honest. That's the epitome of selfishness. We think about everyone else's problem. Now listen, I'm preaching to myself. We think about everyone else's problem except our own, okay? You cannot change a single person in here except the one who raised their hand. That is where your job lies. 
That's where God's trying to work. Yes, we're all selfish. Yes, he wants to change that in you. In you. Okay. Now, this is where it gets personal. And again, just hear me out, because if we're going to confront sin, it gets ugly. It's a church. It's supposed to be messy, right? So if you want to hear pretty, this is not the place. Okay? It may have become the place, but it's not the place anymore. Tonight's the place where we confront sin, and we look it right in the eye, and we just want to, we want to make it better. Okay, we want to make it better. I'm going to, I'm going to list some just observations that I see, and I'm begging you all, don't leave your seat. Seriously. <laughs> Most of it's not about you. <laughs> all right, you ready? Listen. There's been subjects that come up in the church. We're a Facebook church, right? Yeah. Which may, may be good, may suck, I don't know, but it is what it is, okay? So subjects come up on Facebook. So let's just, this is what I, I, try, I was thinking like, well, maybe we'll do a round table about this stuff, or maybe we'll do a special night about this stuff. Why not do it right here, right now, in a family of love? Let's work it out right now, and we, and we won't want to cross the bridge anymore, right? Stay in your seats. Please, stay, raise your hand if you'll stay in your seat. Come on. You see, you've got to be a man, man or woman of, of conviction, right? Of honesty. Okay, let's talk about vaping. Listen, 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 listen. When we talk about vaping. Vaping. <laughs> listen, baby, listen, 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 listen. Okay, vaping is, 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 is the, it's just something that brought out our sinful nature, okay? Who cares about vaping? It's water vapor, okay? It's water vapor. Now, the FDA hasn't approved it yet. There could be carcinogens in it. We don't yet know. It's water vapor. But the use of it has brought something up in all of us. Okay? You say, those that vape, I spoke to in love. And they're like, and I said, I said, listen, you distract people and there's kids that can't distinguish between real smoking, fake smoking, and there's daddy who's in charge, not really in charge, right? And he's letting them do it, so why can't I, you know, we don't want to cross that bridge. So I told him that, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I said, so do it in the lounge, unless it's kids, they go outside, and I'm like, okay. So when you just do it in love, no problem. Let's end the Facebook crap, okay? Every church, including me, I, I do it. Let's just end the crap. You got a problem with someone, there's something in the Bible, that speaks of, if you have a problem with someone, you know what you do? You don't Facebook. You go up to them and you say, Charles, I got a problem. One on one. You're vaping and it's doing this. Okay, we talk. Let's cut the crap with the, with the Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Like, why don't we talk? Whatever happened to honest, face to face communication with the person who's offending you? Whatever happened to that? Am I old school? I may be old school, but it's the right school, right? Just talk to him. I talked to him. Seth, did you get pissed at me when I told you that? Did you say no problem? Problem. That's the way you deal with it. You talk to each other. We're a family. Right? We're a family. You know what the world, you know when the, when the world yells at us about hypocritical and being judgmental, you know what they're doing? They're not picking on us. They're telling us what they want to see. And if we give it to them, they come. But we don't give them what they want to see, so they just part me bitch about it because they have every right to, because we don't show Jesus. We yell at each other. We fight about things. We yell about doctrinal issues. I do it too. I do it, you need to tell me I'm wrong. And here's the thing about vaping. Let's talk about this. It's just the came up, okay? It's harmless. It's water vapor. Here's the problem from, from where I'm standing, because I'm up here and I, and I, and I don't know if I'm blessed or... or Curse that all eyes are on me here, but from here, as soon as the puff of smoke comes up, you know what every head does? And every single thing that whoever's up here is talking about is now out the window. You know, it's very, very difficult to keep someone's attention. And on many, many levels, it's wrong, this, this thing here. And every single time we get up to go to the bathroom 14 times a service, I sat there two weeks ago while Kyle was preaching, I was sick. I was sick. As this man spent, now this is not about God, but it's about respect. We're Christians, right? We're Christians.
Christians. This man probably spent 20 hours preparing spiritual food for you, and we're up and down, up and down, getting cake. It's enough. No one has to pee 14 times a service. Right? We're a family, right? This doesn't even need to go on, on, on YouTube if we don't want to. But look, we don't need to be getting up for cake and party breaks every 13 seconds. I, I, look, I felt bad for him up there, man. I'm like, how the heck does he even keep his focus? Why do you think we had to close the doors? I love the fact we could have sat out there. It's cool, right, Comfy? It was like a freaking parade the whole time, man. I couldn't even pay attention. I couldn't keep focus on what I'm doing. It's rude. People walking. I watch these up here talking. This is people walking right in front of them. Like, really? Who does this? <laughs> Who does this? There's a way to act. There's a way to act. Here's some other ones, man. I'm here, right? I'm happy to serve. I love every single one of you, right? Now, when I talk about this stuff, maybe this stuff's happening at home, too, right? So we can work on it. Let's be people with character. I walk into the bathroom just, I went, I'm going to be honest, I went there to go pee before I got up here, right? Now, I go in there, and the same thing again. The freaking toilet paper is empty, and the new one's sitting on it. Now, 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 that's just one little thing, right? But it speaks of a greater problem. The problem is nobody gives a rip about anybody else. You leave your Every week I come in here and the soda cans and communion cups and water bottles and chairs are just left like this. Don't worry about it. The same will get it. Guys, we're Christians. This is our church. I mean, you don't act like that with your family, right? Do you do that at your house? You, do we do it at our house and expect, I mean, I'm not picking on you, but our kids, they're teenagers. They leave it. Well, don't worry about it. Mom, mom a.k.a. slave, will get it. But we're not like that. We're grown-ups, right? We're grown-ups. We want people to come in here and see something different about us, something that they love, something that they'll enjoy. If I see one more of you parking in a freaking handicapped spot without a handicap tag, I'm going to put a stupid ticket on your car. Judd has it, and it's not good language on it. What are we doing? What would you do if you came up to a church and you were hurting and lost and you heard great things and you came here and you're handicapped and you go to park and some kids parked in your spot and you have to walk from the Presbyterian church? Because we don't have the decency to park in a spot. And leave it for somebody else? I don't get it, man. I just don't get it. I get pushed back all the time when we want to try to do something that takes a leap of faith that's a little bit different, that, that requires out of our, not, not out of the box, out of our box thinking to try to reach souls for Jesus. Churches get this all the time. Because we're infringing upon the way people like it, the way they sing, the way they dress, the way it looks, with no care about anyone else, just this is the way I like it. See, here's the problem. It's always about me. Look at leaving your junk. It's not a big deal, right? But it says something. You don't care about the other people. When you leave the place trashed, what does that say? I mean, I just get, I'm just being honest with you guys. Like, we're, I told them we're family here tonight, right? This is, this is not even for you two, really. There's no new people here. I hate when you guys leave. You leave this place like a stinking mess. And you know what? You leave it for the slave. Yes, I am the slave. And I don't want to be your slave. I want to be a spiritual slave to you. I ain't your mom. I mean, let's be honest. I ain't your mom. I'm not here to pick up your trash. I'm not here to pick up your McDonald's bags that you leave. I'm not here to pick up your garbage. I know it sounds like I'm, I'm ripping on you, but I'm just, I just think it could be different. There's something spiritual in here. I'll get to it, I promise. I do love you guys, honestly. I mean, I, there's things in this church that I do, and, and there's guys that they'll call me out, they'll tell me, and I, I, I welcome that. And some of this is for me, too. And I don't know how to respond to this all the time, too, and I, I fail, but I, I just want to say this, that I don't think that most of you do that stuff intentionally. 
I don't think you're just trying to be a jerk. I don't think you're saying, don't worry. I don't think when you leave your Coke can that you're going, well, don't worry, Moses. Okay. I don't think you do that. I think that we're in a culture that breeds that so much that you can just assimilate into that system without even noticing it. Do you, do you know how many times, this, this week was a miracle. Do you know how many times when you guys first start coming to the time, like maybe 6.15, I have to close that door? The front door. I, I want, this is what I watch. I'm telling you. I, I'm probably crazy because I look at stuff like this. Okay? I see this. Just walk. Do you guys realize that I'm just picking on, just, it's just me, okay? I really don't want Jameson to walk out of that street and get killed. But you don't even, I, I'm, I'm not, please just accept this the right way. You don't even have the decency close the freaking door behind you. Like, it's my job. Is it going to take me getting run over for someone to finally close that freaking door? I, I, I'm telling you, six, seven, eight, ten times a week, I'm closing the door behind you. Just absolutely no care. I got it. Who cares what happens after me? I got it. It's just not right. It's just not right. But I want to do this, okay? <clears throat> I want to fantasize with you a little bit. Let's fantasize a little bit together. Imagine, if you will, something that is way, way different than what I just painted the picture of. Okay? And, and I know some of you are probably sitting there going, that's not really it. That's not really what happens. It is what happens. I'm not making it up. I want to fantasize about something a little bit different. Actually, a, a lot different. Why does it, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> Why does it feel so good when you go to Walmart and there's this lady in line in front of you with like two carriage fulls of stuff and you walk up with gum and she says, oh, honey, is that all you have? Yes, ma'am. Oh, why don't you just go back? Right? Feels good, right? You feel like you sit a lot of it. Like, this should be something that you ponder. 
This should be something that you consider. You should be thinking about this, like on a daily basis, a, a, a routine, a discipline. Think about the things that we do. Thought, action, everything we say. Think about this. It's not something that's going to happen naturally because we're bent on sin. So it's not going to happen. What's happening is natural man. What, wants, what should be happening is spiritual man who's actually thinking of others as more important than themselves. Now this sounds strange, but to actually think each day about your actions. Before you step out of the bed, before you step into the truck, before you go to work, before you come to church, before you interact with anyone, think about the things that you're doing. Put them above yourself. They are more important. Okay, that's what we need to do. That's what he's asked us to do. And to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. He endured the pain and the shame of the cross for you. You see? That's the attitude of Christ. Putting you before himself. Father, if there's any other way, but your will be done because I want to save them, because I love them, and I'll, I'll endure the cross and the shame and the pain of it all because of them. And that's the way we're supposed to be. Let it sink in. That's the way we're supposed to be. Can you imagine a church? Just imagine a church. But here's the fantasy. Imagine a church that is filled a community, a family that is filled with Philippians 2, 3, and 4 attitude, be like Jesus, humble servants, thinking of everyone else instead of themselves. Think about what that church would be. Oh, to get back in the book of Acts. When they all got together, and they were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to each other. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to prayer and breaking of bread and, and the goodwill of all men. Oh, that we could get back there. Right? I hear people say it all the time. The book of Acts church, first, chapter 2 and chapter 4, those, that was good. And when they were doing that, when they were putting others above themselves in great community, what did the Bible say? God added to the fellowship every day those who were being saved. That they come in, they see this tremendous countercultural kind of family that actually cares more about other people than themselves, and they want to be a part of that. It's so attractive. Can you imagine what it would be like? And think about it for a second. Like, let's just, let's just make it down to the ground. Okay, not the high holy gospel. Let's get down to the ground. Let's just say in a church of 100 people, if we were that kind of a church, that everyone just thought of everyone else as more important than them, think about it for a minute. You have 99 people who come here with the sole purpose of serving you. Who think you are more important than them. Uh, 99 people. Who wouldn't want that? You don't get that anywhere in this entire world. A group of people that outnumber you dramatically that come with the intention of serving you and encouraging you. But that's what the, that's what the church is supposed to be. It's not leave it for the next guy. It's all about me. No, it's all about somebody else. Everyone else is more important than you. Everyone. When you lay that picture down, when you lay this beautiful picture of humility and service down over me picking on you, all of a sudden the pick just doesn't hurt as much anymore, does it? When you start to consider these things, not just like, oh, he's being a jerk. No, you start to think. Man, that's what Jesus did. Maybe I don't do that so much, but that's what Jesus did. That's why I come. I come because I want to be more like Jesus. You see, I can't speak of everyone here. I know why I come. I don't know why you come. But I would venture to say that in this church, most of you come because you love Jesus. You want to learn something, you want to become more like him. Do you agree? That's the reason why you got in the car. That's why you, you came here tonight instead of going somewhere else. Oh, so if that's the intention, and that's what you've come to do, putting other people above yourselves might just mean thinking for a moment, just think. If I pick on yourself and I love you, if I bathe, 
or I get up and I go back and forth, or I, I don't know, anything that distracts, then I've just imposed my will on the other 99 people who came to do this, but because I want to do this, I don't care what they do. I don't care what they think. I'm connecting you, do you know what I'm saying? If something you do out of your desire to please yourself distracts the other people in the church who came for a reason, if you're distracting them from it, love says you won't do it anymore. That's love. If you love other people, you will do something. You will sacrifice of yourself. You will bleed for them. You will hurt for them because you love them. That's Christian. That's what we're supposed to do. Oh. We're supposed to hurt. Well, I have to keep you away. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I can see it's working. <laughs> hey, Pat. <laughs> Coffee man.
didn't even want to leave. You ever been there? I didn't want to leave. I had no desire. And so what I did is I went up to the woods up in Georgia, up in the mountains, where Darren and Linda Barrett live, and I'm walking around. It's kind of raining, and I take my Bible up there, and I walk around the mountains, and I'm like, okay, I'll just go out in nature, and I'll see his wonders and his creative power, and then I'll read, and it'll open up the scriptures to me. So I'm walking along, and it's like nothing. Now, I've never heard the audible voice of God, but right down in here, you know what I'm talking about, the this thing? He's like, put your book down, bro. You ain't going to find me there. You're going to find me here. So I just tucked it back up underneath my jacket, 27 degrees, I had a jacket. And I just hung out, and, we, and I cried, and I yelled at him, and I talked with him, and then I shut up, and I listened, and I, I experienced it. Like, I, have, I don't have a good view of God. I don't have a very good view of God. So, I don't think anybody does. I think we need to work on that. He says to his disciples, how long have I been with you, and still you do not know? He says that to me. But here's the thing, if God is truly God, then... The worship of every soul on earth is justified and due to him, isn't it? When you look at this text here, that's not what's really happening. He's not a bloodline God. He's not a, if I do good enough God. I don't even know where they got that. Okay? He's not that. So the question, the first one was, is he mean and stupid? I think we answered that he's not. We just asked questions to point out flaws in your heart. But the, the real question here is, who is this God? That's what this story brings up to me. Who is this God? And whose is this God? So that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And, and if we answer those questions, we'll get the main question at the beginning that I asked about what was the purpose of this healing miracle and why was it recorded? Is it to show his power? Yes. Is it to show his deity? Yes. But what I believe most importantly is to show his sovereignty, which is authority over something, to explain it to us so we can understand that he is sovereign over all these things. So the question here that, that this story begins is, because they're saying, send her away. She's a Gentile. She doesn't deserve this. She's a dog, and we're the children of Israel. She doesn't deserve what you got. Send her away. And Jesus is kind of going along with that to point out something. So the question really is, is who can worship this God? Who is allowed to worship God? Who can say Christ is my king? Who can say it? The Bible tells us. Anyone? Who said anyone? Read Psalm 15 with me. This is going to tell us, it, it kind of tells us who can. Kind of gives us hope, right? Read here, you ready? You guys all there? Psalm 15, you ready? Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do right, and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord. And keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. So it kind of gives us hope. It says that there's some people. But let's go down the list a little bit slower now. Who can worship you? Who can come into your presence? Uh, those who are blameless. Who's blameless? Want to know a synonym for blameless? Flawless. Want to know another one? Perfect. Those who are blameless can stand in his presence and worship him. Look, let's just, if you're still on the list, if you're still on the list, you self-righteous thing, you, you, let's just see if you can stay on it. Those who do right. Those who speak the truth, now that's half. You speak the truth, you're an honest fellow, right? From a sincere heart. That means you're doing it, not just telling the truth because you're a good, righteous fellow, but you're doing it for the right reasons. Not to try to manipulate the situation to get what you want. From a sincere heart. 
Those who refuse to gossip, we just lost half the crowd there, or harm their neighbors, or speak evil of their friends. I don't know if there's anyone still on this list. Those who despise flagrant sinners, well, we probably all are that. We can say we're that. We despise those sinners, right? Don't dare look in the mirror. Everyone else is selfish. But we made the list, finally. Uh, honor the faithful followers of the Lord. Keep their promises even when it hurts. Well, anyone who just made the list, they just fell right off again, didn't they? Those who lend money without charging interest. That doesn't happen too often either, does it? Yeah. So who can stand before the Lord and worship Him? Those that are blameless, perfect people. Paul kind of picked up on this thing from God. In Romans chapter 3, he says things like this. No one's righteous. No one is righteous. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. No one does good. Everyone sins and falls short of God's glorious standard, which, by the way, is flawless. No one lives up to that. So the answer to the question of who can worship him? No one. No one deserves to worship God. Did you hear what I'm saying? You don't deserve it. It is a gift. You bring nothing to the table for God. You bring death and sin and ugly, and he gives you the privilege of worshiping him. Get your brain around that. You bring nothing to God. He gives you life. You give him death. Disciples felt this hopelessness. In Matthew 19, 25, he said, he said, it's explaining about who can get in, who can't. And they finally throw their hands up and they say, then who in the world can be saved? Who can be saved? Psalm 15 tells us only the blameless. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter how about anyone else's prayers. Only the blameless could stand in his presence and worship him. Go to Colossians chapter 1. On the screen you see the page. Moving into a very dark place. Very great darkness. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Jesus is the visible image of God. He's a creator. He existed before everything. He holds all creation together as the head of the church and supreme over everything. Who's, who's blameless? Anybody? Who has blame? Verse 21, this includes you. This tells us of our blame. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, remember the verb just read to you of Psalm 15. As a result, he has brought you into his presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. <clears throat> no one deserves to stand in the presence of God and worship him outside of the grace of Jesus Christ. And if you've received that grace, Church folks get mad at you. You're the luckiest man or woman who's ever walked the face of the earth. You do not deserve this. 
none of us deserve it. And so we can't look inward as the, as the Jewish disciples did and said, he's my God. He's not your God. You don't own him. He bought you at a high price. He owns you. Why this lesson? Why not examine the miracle just to show how powerful it is? Well, sometimes God does some funky stuff. And we don't understand it, right? You guys there? All the time. God does some funky stuff. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile the, the, the tsunami that kills thousands of people? How do you, how do you do it? Like, you, how do you do it? Like, we, 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 we say, God, it's a beautiful day like today. Oh, God gave us a beautiful day. This is the Lord the day that, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? He's the God of good weather. Is he the God of bad weather? He is. But we don't understand that sometimes. Until we read Job, where it talks about that he guides the rain and the lightning and the thunder and the winds. Like, we know he's the God of all weather. You see, when God does funky stuff like this, take it from the children, give it to the dogs. I'm not here for you. If you have not been a student of the scriptures and you don't know the character of God as, it, as laid out in the Bible, you see things come up and you're like, what the heck is that? And it's confusing and it's scary, and sometimes you lose your faith unless you really know who God is. And that's what I, I welcome you into. The Jews try to cram God into their created God mold, and we do it as well. So, what I want to encourage you to do is to really get to know God. See, I, I don't want to say that He's not just found here, He's found here. But I tell people all the time I'm guilty book down, go to the beach, put the book down, go to the woods, go spend time with your creator, get to know him, so when funky things come up, right, you're not thrown off, get to know the Lord, and the suffering in your life, and there's bad weather that comes along, and you get godly discipline, that spanking from the Lord, when you've done wrong, and it hurts, why does that happen? God's like, that's how I roll. That's how I do it. Don't, don't be surprised when these things happen. Because that's, that's who I am. That's who I really am. That's why I gave you the Bible. So you know who I am. Romans 15, 4 says, these things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. That's why this miracle is recorded. Is it awesome that he, that he healed this girl who, who was possessed? Yeah, that's awesome. He wasn't even with her. He did it from afar. He threw his voice. That's awesome. But, but why was it recorded? To teach us who he really is. And to teach us to not be inwardly, inwardly focused on ourselves. And my encouragement to you is this. Be like Jesus. Have the same attitude of Jesus. Let me ask you just one last question before we're done. Okay? We're just going to sing a song and we're going to go home. If Jesus Christ was sitting here and he got a drink, right? got a drink. First of all, if it said to pay for it, you think he would? Yes. Yeah. Well, he made his own. Yeah. Shameless plug for the Lord. But let me ask you a question. Do you think he just, not, this, this might sound stupid, but do you think he just lay it there? Because that's where I find most of it. it. Often it's not even on the chair. It's just fun. Okay, so the Bible says when they have the same attitude as Christ. And see, we, we think about you know, the high, holy, and religious things because we're in church. Why not the practical? You know, there's the gospel that's up here, all high and holy stuff. How about the gospel down here where the rubber meets the road? How about thinking of others as more important than yourself? Picking up your stuff and maybe even picking up someone else's. Maybe this is wrong, but you know, we're family. Why do we have an official cleaning lady in candy? Why? Yeah, but why, why, why would we? Right? Why, 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 would, why does she need to come in here and clean up after us? Do you guys love candy? Do you guys love candy? 
Okay, so here's the thing, right? She died, right? She died. Why not make her job really easy? It would be awesome if she called Meredith this week and said, hey, you know, I went to the church to clean it, and I didn't need to. That'd be awesome, right? That'd be fantastic. And that's just a superficial thing, but you know what it says? It says that you are considering others as more important than yourself. Okay? So that's my challenge for you this week, to be actually thinking about this. Don't just let the message be like, hey, Moses is a jerk. He yelled at us. I thought he was my friend. I am your friend. I'm your friend enough to love you, to point out flaws so that you can get better and be more like Jesus. That's my job, and I love you guys, and I want to do it, and I love you to do the same thing for me if you see me acting in a way that's not Christ-like. Okay? Let's pray, and then we're going to sing. Father, I thank you for, the, uh, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it's clear. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the ability to live under its authority. The Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And so we do have the ability to obey what this says and trust that the results will be the best. Your word tells us that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. And I believe with all my heart, Lord, that Revolution Church is filled with people who love you and are called to your purpose. Help us to have your attitude in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.